So welcome everybody. Um, it's a really, tr it's a treat to be here. And I want to thank Anna Sternschies for having invited me and my collaborator, Julia Eisenberg, who has taken me on a wild journey to figure out what it means for a scholar to work with an artist to basically produce what we are going to see tonight in abbreviated form. Um, let me think. Where to start? How about at the beginning? When I first discovered the life story of the person you're going to learn about tonight, Lynn Yaldati. So the year is 2008, so it's now almost 10 years ago. And I was having Shabbat dinner, or Friday night dinner, with a lesbian cantor of Berlin. Her name was Yalda Raebling. And so we're having a nice dinner, and I sort of casually asked her, so how did you become a cantor? And she said, quote, well, and she has this like way about her, sort of, well, of course you should know that I was the star of East German Yiddish theater. So I looked at her, and I, I'm a scholar of communist Yiddish culture, as Anna has already told you, and I've never heard of this East German Yiddish theater. I'm like, so when, what does one do when one is posed that kind of thought? One says, tell me more. And so she proceeded to tell me for maybe one hour the story of how her mother, Lynn Yaldati, was the most well-known Yiddish singer in communist East Germany, which I'm going to refer to here as, as the GDR, German Democratic Republic. So over the course of this hour-long dinner, um, I'm hearing story after story about this woman who is either unbelievable or going to be the subject of my next research project. And because I'm here, you know that it turned out to be, this unbelievable story turned out to be true. And I basically sort of said, this can't just be a book. It needs to be something that is bringing this amazing woman's story to life in an, emb in an embodied way. And so I called up my friend, Julia Eisenberg, who agreed to uh, help me figure out how to take this story to all of you. So let me tell you the story of Lynn Yaldati. So Lynn Yaldati was the stage name of Rebecca Brillesleiper, born in 1912 in Amsterdam. And she was early on interested in dancing and singing. And she's Jewish and she's Dutch because she's born in Amsterdam, but she did not speak Yiddish natively. She actually had to learn Yiddish from the small Eastern European Jewish immigrant community living in Amsterdam. And so she learned from this community about what it was like to sort of think about Eastern European Jewish culture being brought to a Western Jewish audience. And so she makes her living doing chorus lines. So you'll see, I actually can't tell the difference between, I don't know which one is Lynn Yaldati um, or Rebecca Brillesleiper, which is her maiden name. Um, she takes the name Lynn Yaldati when she first starts performing her Jewish music. So in this chorus line, she's still Rebecca Brillesleiper. Um, but to perform, she ends up taking on these characters that are from popular um, Yiddish theater. Um, so um, Jews composed music and choreographed dances that were organized around biblical stories, for example, or um, Yiddish classical Hasidic tradition. So here you have her dressed as Die Schnurren, or the beggar woman. Here she is Rebecca at the well, which is from the, story, the biblical story of Rebecca and Isaac. And here she is dressed up as a yeshiva bocher. And this was quite surprising to me that a woman who is dressing up as a yeshiva bocher would be able to perform dressed up this way in multiple contexts. So she is performing dressed as a yeshiva bocher. Oh, and she's also dressed as, the, um, as a sort of high priest. Do it, and we can know that she's trying to be the high priest because she's got the high priest's hand gesture. So the, the Spock gesture, for those of you who know what I'm talking about. So she performed this both in leftist cabaret settings like the world art cabaret that you see here, and you can see that there's a lot of gender play going on in this image. Um, nobody is as they seem. And then she's also, this is what I found fascinating, she's also doing this for the immigrant Jewish community themselves, itself. 
And I have to wonder what was going through their minds when they saw this being performed on stage. And she's not alone, actually, in doing this kind of performance. There are many people doing this kind of performance in interwar Europe. So she meets um, this man sitting at the piano whose name is Eberhard Raebling. He is not a Jew. He's a German who, who um, left Nazi Germany in 1936. He was a member of the Nazi Music Union. Um, even after he left the country. And he ends up falling in love with Lynn Yaldati, and he accompanies her for her entire career. And he is the one who encourages her to stop doing this silly chorus line dancing and to actually take up full time her Jewish art and culture because there's something sort of anti-fascist about performing Yiddish in 1930s Europe. He, so, just to, uh, one more sense about Eberhard Raebling, he was a classically trained musician, pianist. He got his PhD in musicology, and you had to join the Nazi music union if you wanted to perform in Nazi Germany. So, if you were not Jew, Jews were not allowed to join the Nazi music union, um, but if you were a non-Jew, you were expected to join the Nazi music union. It does not mean he was a Nazi. It means he wanted to perform in Germany. So he left Germany, and then basically he got in trouble, and he was asked to resign from the Nazi Music Union. Um, he got reports of having performed with a Jew <laughs> in Amsterdam. That's funny. I think you want to do Chazan of Shabbos now. Got it. I'll do it from here. Right? Do you want to explain the song? I will. Okay. Okay, so um, as David was saying, her repertoire in the 30s, Lilia Dati's repertoire in the 30s is a mix of like music from uh, Hasidic tradition and Yiddish films, and she's dancing and singing that with these costumes. And um, as you mentioned also, that gender play is very common in this scene right now. So across the, across the pond you have like Molly Picon is doing this kind of gender play. Uh, within Europe, you have like Pepe Littman is doing that kind of gender play. So this idea of uh, Eastern Europe, European Jews moving west and that displacement is also being kind of reflected in this um, kind of fun gender stuff that's happening. Uh, in this song that we're about to do, aside from her, when she does it, there's some gender play involved, but in, there's also a lot of play with the vocals. So um, you get to kind of creatively explore both ethnic identification and also distancing that happens during it. So the song describes a roving cantor who's going from place to place and who comes to town on Shabbat and is greeted by the town's three wealthiest people who happen to be a little tailor, a little blacksmith, and a little wagon driver. Though how little can a wagon driver be? I'm curious about that. Anyway, and they praise the singer in ways that reflect their jobs. And we have a, a Judea, within Judaism, we have a long tradition of this. So, for example, in the High Holy Day liturgy, and like a song like Kihine we have uh, we have liturgy also where we understand the holy as a reflection of uh, labor and honoring labor. So you can really understand that Lynn, as she's kind of a new communist in the 30s, she just joined the Communist Party. Um, is kind of singing this as a kind of a public call to honor labor, that even the cantor singing God's praises is a worker. Kimmen herren die drei schönste Ballerbatten von dem Städtler. Hey, a uh, hey, a uh, hey. Einer a Schneiderl und einer a Kowalczyk und einer a Balagotschnik. Ruf sich ob der Schneiderl a hey. Oi, hat er gedacht. Oi, hat er gedacht. So wie mir geht, mitten vor dem Erzieh, 
mit dem Nadel ein Stach. Ah. Also hat er gedacht. So they take this show on the road throughout Holland from 1938 until um, World War II breaks out, which Holland does not want to get involved in World War II, and they had successfully remained neutral during World War I. But unfortunately, World War II does not turn out the same way. On May 10th, 1940, the German armies invade the Netherlands and basically upturns the entire society of the Netherlands, including in particular for these two people. For her, she's a Jew, and she has to go underground, and she's actually giving, um, she's giving dance lessons at the beginning of the invasion. He gets a, an order to report to the Wehrmacht, the German military, in early 1942. He does not want to report for duty, and he goes into hiding. And basically, if he were caught by the Germans, he would be shot. She and her family get a deportation order in summer 1942. And they both go into hiding with their families. And one of the things that I find amazing is that while they're in hiding, they still are giving concerts. And basically, I found this in her personal archive in Berlin, which is just a one sheet of paper, but basically it's the exact same thing that you heard her perform in the pre-war period. So they go into hiding, and they're working with the Dutch communist underground. He is now flirting with communism, and he will become a more important communist than she will after the war. But at this point, she's the only member of the Dutch Communist Party, but they're both working for the underground, um, which is the communists are, are sort of in control of the underground in Holland until 1944, when they, their hideout, which you see here, and which this is what the hideout looks like today, so these are amazing things you can do with Google Earth. Creepy, but one can do them for research purposes only. Um, they get betrayed, and they don't know by whom. Um, but there's a trial, post-war trial, to try to figure out if this person did actually um, betray them. But this is summer 1944, and perhaps the most famous victim of the Holocaust, her family is also betrayed in the summer of 1944, and that's Anne Frank. And the, all four sisters, so that's um, Lynn and Lynn's sister Yanni and Anna and Marco, Frank, all end up at Vesterbork, which is the transit camp in Holland. And they're all on the last train out of Vesterbork, September 5th, 1941. They're transported to Auschwitz. So this is what Vesterbork looks like. They're all transported to Auschwitz. And then the four of them survive Auschwitz and end up in Bergen-Belsen, where, as the story goes, Lynn and Yanni nurse the sick and dying Anne and Marco Frank from typhus until their deaths. And Lynn ends up getting typhus as well, um, but she survives um, until liberation, which is April 15th, 1945. The British Army liberates the camp. She makes her way home, broken and battered, 
and with the mark of Auschwitz, the tattoo on her, on her arm. And she actually uses the tattoo as part of her performances in the post-war period, which is something I find very powerful in thinking about how the body can be used in terms of the re audience response. So she is, in the summer 1945, she's not in such a, she, her body has been destroyed. She lost a huge amount of weight. I um, mean, it takes the summer for her to recover both her body and her voice. But one thing she does do is she answers an ad placed by Otto Frank in the local newspaper saying, does anyone know the fate of my two daughters? I survived. I don't know what happened to them after we were separated at Auschwitz. Um, and in fact, Lynn and Yanni respond to that ad. And so they tell him the story about her da his daughters dying of typhus at Bergen-Belsen. And for that piece of information, he is forever indebted to both Lynn and Yanni. And I found a book, the first edition of um, Het Achterhaus, for, which is the 1947 edition of Anne Frank's journal that um, he published in a very small print run, like 300 copies. And she had one of those copies. So she finally is giving concerts again in the late summer of 45. This is a concert program from Purim, um, which is 1946. She's giving concerts in the post-war period. You have to imagine that this is a society that has just been totally devastated. Um, there are Jews basically, there are not really very many Jews left to even go to concerts. Um, so she's performing for the Dutch Zionist Union, which is this, they're putting on this Purim con concert. Um, she's also performing for the Jewish Coordinating Committee, which was working in relief efforts around post-war Europe. But she's also going on tour, and she's going on tour to a phenomenon called displaced persons camps, which are scattered throughout Europe. So Germany has the majority of them, but they're not just in Germany. There's in France, Italy, Eastern Europe, but also in Scandinavia and the largest community of displaced persons, which is how Holocaust survivors were referred to in this period, um, was in Sweden. And so she's giving concert, Yiddish concerts in Sweden, and she's also sort of on a, a, a salvage mission to recover the lost remnants of Yiddish culture that had just been destroyed during the war. She ends, and she's still with her, by the way, she reunites with her husband who had gone into hiding after the after their hideout got betrayed. He survived in Holland with their daughter, and he is now accompanying her again. And so they're both on tour, and they end up back in his hometown of Berlin. So Berlin is now occupied by four powers. So that's the Americans, the French, the British, and the Soviets. And there's even a displaced persons camp in the city of Berlin called Schlachtensee. And the Schlachtensee camp has a theater called Baderich which they perform for. So this is, I found a photograph of what the audience at the Baderich Theater would have looked like. So this is not one of her concerts, but you can imagine that this is what an audience at the um, Baderich Theater would have looked like. And so in the post-war period, so I have this image up because to me it's her, and she was a big fan of having masks made for her performances in the pre-war period as well. But she did not have a mask that looked like this. So this is to the dance called Death and the Maiden. And I feel like this is an image of her sort of ghostly survival presence. Um, and so she performs with the mask on stage, as you can see here. This is a stage photograph, but it's not, but presumably she was actually doing this on the stage of the theaters that she was performing in. And so one of the songs that she had heard in the concentration camps was um, called Esprint. Um, and to say a little bit more about the song that is going to be our next song, I'm calling up my collaborator. Cool. Collaborator in the sense that we're working together. <laughs> Not that we're the Vichy government. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this song, Esprint, it's burning. Uh, it was written by Mordechai Gebirtig, who was a furniture builder and a Bundist and also kind of responsible for a lot of Yiddish songs that we understand as folklore. And he, he also understood his music as folk music. He wrote this song in response to a pogrom in a small village right outside of Krakow. And its opening figure uses the sound of the, the Krakow fire engines of that time. 
Uh, the words admonish people to do something in the face of destruction. And we wondered as we were preparing the song what, what, what it would have been like for survivors to hear, to hear the song and, and, and hear these lyrics, how they would receive that. Das ganze Städtel eingeschlungen und die Besen finden Hutschen, als er umschauen brennt. Und ihr Städten guckt er so sich mit verlegter Hand. Und ihr Städten guckt er so sich, unser Städtel brennt. So she, so she performed in Schlachtensee concentration camp in 1947 and 1948. And then, and because Raebling's family lived there, they were making repeat visits. Um, and his family was actually former Nazis. So you got to imagine what it's like for a Jewish Auschwitz survivor to go hang out with the in-laws in immediate post-war Germany. So she was looking for things to do. So in 1949, after the DP camp at Schlachtensee had closed, she performs for the United Jewish Community of Berlin. And she's also performing for the first time in an explicitly communist context <coughs> called the Kulturbund. 
and her repertoire also changes a little bit. So as she's performing in more communist contexts, she is starting to mine the Jewish musical tradition for more political songs. So she goes back to the long history of Yiddish, um, Yiddish political music, Yiddish leftist and socialist music, to say the Bund and the 1905 revolution. And she is singing these songs on East Berlin radio. You heard that right. Lin Yaldati is singing Yiddish on East Berlin radio in 1949. And one of the songs she adds to her repertoire at this point in time, which will then stay in her entire repertoire for the rest of her career, is Brieder mir haben geschlossen. Um, do you want to just say something about Spottlieder? Or not really? You can do that. So uh, one thing that's interesting about this is she, she has kind of a repertoire of satirical songs that are in Yiddish, and that actually falls into a kind of a German tradition called Spottlieder, which are um, it's kind of an anti, anti-authoritarian tradition of song, So and this is part of that. Um, this is an interesting song because it was kept both in male and female vocal traditions. In the male tradition, it's kept as like, brothers we have sworn, like brothers we have decided, and we'll kind of close this song with that version, but we open it with the female, the, the, the one that was kept by women, um, which is less fiery. And just something about it is that um, Jews have been singing about police violence for a really long time. So here's a song, a song about that. Alles fängt in Arbeit und Sie hat doch von Gott nicht gewählt. Es hat eins erfahren, ich kommande. Und mein Hand hat Hammel im Geschirr. So she's now performing in communist contexts. And so the Polish communist government invites her to tour Poland. And so this is a poster from her concert in, uh, I think it's in Łódź when she's performing on stage with Zigan and Schumacher, who are very, very well-known Yiddish comics. But you'll note that she's got the top billing. Um, so she goes from Łódź and uh, Wrocław and Warsaw, maybe. I don't think she was ever in Warsaw because Warsaw was still in rubble at this point. Um, she goes from there to Prague, where she is singing with the famous Paul Robeson, who is on his own communist tour from the United States, and that's him on the left. And you can see he's towering over her. <laughs> she, was, but she was both petite and he was a very tall man. Um, so she is basically now being sort of given the entree into the communist musical world, 
especially via Paul Robeson. And she goes back to Amsterdam and realizes that she's really having a hard time making things work for her in ever more Cold War um, Holland. And he is actually now a leader in the Dutch Communist Party, and he applies for a return to his hometown of Berlin. This is his application to return. Oh, I should mention, by the way, that she's performing as a communist at Israel celebrations. So this is in the early period when Israeli independence did not mean not leftist. It meant some kind of a fusion between leftist and national. So she's invited to perform for the Zionist, uh, the Dutch Zionist Union. She doesn't ever make Aliyah or move to Israel. Um, but she is constantly fascinated by the state of Israel. So he applies to move back to East Germany because, to the GDR, because he was invited to serve as the editor of their state music journal. And this I found in the archive. This is his request for permission and then the permission being granted. Now, once again, you have to imagine what's going on in her mind when she's being asked to re relocate her family from her hometown of Amsterdam to the place that orchestrated the mass murder of her family. Um, but she decides to move for the best of the family. So he is taking on important roles in East German society. So he's the editor of the Music Union Journal. He ends up becoming the head of a conservatory in East Berlin and eventually a member of the communist, of the uh, parliament in East Berlin and East Germany. But what's she gonna do? So you can see that this is a photograph I found in her archive of teaching folk dance to German youth. I don't want to even get into the aesthetics of what's going on in this picture. But she's also actually performing what she's now morphing into her sort of leftist and Yiddish anti-fascist repertoire. And so she first performs in East Germany after she relocates. In November, on November 9th, 1952, which is an important date. It's this Thursday, and it's why presumably this week is Holocaust ed Education Week. Um, it's commemorating Kristallnacht, which was the pogrom in Nazi Germany in, on November 9th, the night of November 9th, 1938. And it was very popularly celebrated amongst German Jews. But it also was a holiday that got adopted by the East German state as part of its um, anti-fascist um, identity as part of its state anti-fascist identity. So this is a concert on um, November 9th, 1952. So think about what's going on in 1952 in the world. For those of you who know, for those of you who don't know, it's not good. Um, in the Soviet Union, for example, in Moscow, um, Yiddish writers had just been killed and there was a, about to be what's called the doctor's plot and basically Soviet Jews were about to be deported to the Far East. And yet, this proves that Jewish culture under communism was allowed and not allowed, but was an important part of a particular state's identity. And these three songs that she sang in this very first concert are all songs we're performing for you tonight. So East Germany not only made it a holiday, but it actually produced a postage stamp for Kristallnacht, the first country in the world to ever have a Kristallnacht commemorative stamp. Um, and I think it's actually very powerful. This, I found this in the archive, and I was like, I need to get this. How am I going to get it? I went to the archivist, and I'm like, how do I get a copy of this? And she's like, well, you can order a copy of it. I went on eBay, and it came in the mail in like two weeks for like five bucks. <laughs> so this is my own personal copy. Damn you, archives. It was going to be black and white, too. So I think the color is also very powerful about this burning image of a synagogue, by the way, that was rebuilt in East Germany. This was the Dresden synagogue that East Germany very proudly invested funds in to sort of demonstrate their, um, their ability to support their Jewish community. And in German, it says, never again, Kristallnacht. So she gave her first solo concert of, um, these are, uh, Let's see, Kampflied are sort of part of, um, sort of songs. battle songs um, and partisan songs. And these are mostly from the, her new repertoire, but there are a few holdouts from her pre-war um, music, like the song that um, we would have sung in place of um, Chazanaf Shabbos, which is the cantor on Shabbat. Um, this is called Rabosai, which you see the word here, Spotlied. 
That's the sort of satiric song that comes from the 1848 German musical tradition. So then, but she recognizes that Yiddish music is only going to go so far in Germany, which doesn't really have any native Yiddish speakers living there. So she broadens her repertoire to include a lot of leftist German music, including music from Hans Eisler. Um, so Eisler is a, a great, great 20th century composer. I highly recommend him if you don't already know him. You might already know work by Kurt Weil, who is his contemporary and is more famous in the States. Um, he was actually here in the States and he did a lot of really beautiful film scores. You might know him from that. Eisler studied under Schoenberg and he was comfortable with 12-tone composition, serialism, but as he became radical, um, he also incorporated jazz and cabaret forms so that he could you know, be more one with the people. He wrote songs to news clippings and he wrote film scores and he also wrote Lieder and like high culture things. He was a very versatile composer. Um, he, uh, while he was in America, he was, so he was, he was exiled, he, he fled Germany, and then he was in the States, um, you know, as he was at the New School, and he was then working in Hollywood, uh, and then during the HUAC trials, during uh, the House of Un-American Activity, uh, called him the Karl Marx of music, <laughs> which is, like, I wish somebody would call me that. <laughs> so I'm rather to be like Bakunin, but it's okay. That's, that would be good enough. Um, so eventually, he was he was he was exiled from from America, and he he wrote a very sad letter about it. And he's, his 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 sister actually knocked him out, terrible. And he says that he he understood having to flee Nazi Germany, but having to flee America was was really hard on him. Um, but he came back and he was, became a famous and established uh, composer in East Germany. He wrote uh, the East German National Anthem and the Solidarity Song, and he had written the United Front Song during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, he had a lifelong collaboration with Bertolt Brecht, and this song is part of that collaboration. It's part of one of their learning plays, which um, were to learn and to teach, uh, and it's from a play called The Measures Taken, or The Decision. Are we There is rice down the river, in the provinces up the river. People need rice. If we bring the rice from the warehouse, we can charge them more. Those other people will then get much less rice.
So Lynn actually starts to become famous in the GDR. And she gets published in newspapers. They're doing features about her. She is performing in smoky cabaret bars like Die Möwe or The Siegel or Chaika in Russian. And she is also known as the Jewish Auschwitz survivor. Now, being an Auschwitz survivor in the GDR was, did not make you Jewish the way it did here, because the East Germ GDR basically built its identity on the fact that Nazism was persecuting communists. And so what you see in this photograph is the red triangle, which was the dominant symbol of the camps in East Germany. But you see that over the Israeli flag. What year do you think this is? 1948. So this is the right when, this is September 1948 for East German Memorial Day, which was the second Sunday of September. And this was when Israel was still the darling of communist Europe. That's not going to last very long. Um, but the red triangle is going to become the important symbol of the camps, concentration camps under fascism. So she is the sort of leading voice about the Holocaust, being a Jewish Auschwitz survivor. So she's asked to speak at symposia about Auschwitz. And so this is an image I found, ver I found in her archive as well. Um, this is a famous image of the, um, the ramp at Auschwitz. And you can see she is right here. And she's giving concerts throughout, East, um, throughout the GDR, through the 50s. And then she gets in touch with Otto Frank. Remember him? He owed her a favor. So she called in that favor by writing to him requesting permission to produce the new play, The Diary of Anne Frank, in East Germany. And he said, as long as you're not using it for political purposes, go for it. And she said, OK, thank you. So this is a playbill, a concert bill, where she is singing Yiddish songs right before a public reading of the Diary of Anne Frank, which is the Francis Goodrich and Albert Hackett version from 1955. But even more than that, she got permission to produce the first ever version of film version of the Diary of Anne Frank. And East Germany decides that she is the perfect person to take this film on the road. So she goes to London in 1959. That's this, um, this is produced, it's, you can see it's in English. This is the first thing I think I've shown you that has English on it. So she's in London for three weeks. Um, the film got censored by the um, London Film Bureau because they said it's libelous to living people because the film actually is not really about Anne Frank's diary. It's about calling out the fascists who are in the West German government. This was a common tactic of GDR films in, this in the late 50s and early 60s to be um, basically making films that are basically accusing fascism of still living in the other Germany. So they, she gets press, um, press coverage all over the media in London. And she is even on television. She was a very fine and good uh, girl, you know, and uh, she's a good, a very good comrade. It's not living for herself alone, but every time together with her friends, you know. Did you know that she had written or could write a diary like she did? No, I have never. Did she tell any story, no. any stories at all in the, in the concentration? Yes, I have told many stories and said the story for the father or so she was at least trilingual, right? Dutch, um, German, and English here. But she also spoke Yiddish relatively fluently. And I like to think of, for her, Yiddish is this, before the war, it's sort of a political language. But after the war, it's both politics. But it's also about um, memories of her family. So she sings to sold out crowds in London, Manchester, and, um, and Leeds. And this is 1,500 seats in the middle of the theater district in London. So people were very interested in hearing her sing. And notice who is on stage with her. 
That's an image of Anne Frank, for those of you who do not recognize it. So this concert was done sort of in honor of Anne Frank. So one of the songs that she's singing, and she sings it, and the audience starts to participate in it, is called Zog Nit Kemo. And so this is the, um, let's see, never say that you're on your last road. And I've, it was written in 1943 in the Vilna Ghetto. And it became, I'd like to think of it as the sort of Jew European Jewish national anthem um, in the immediate post-war period before Israel's national anthem, Hatikva, or the hope, sort of pushed this song out of the sort of Jewish national consciousness. But it remained a song that leftist Jews sang because they didn't really want to sing Israel's national anthem. So this song stays part of her repertoire throughout her entire career. Um, I was going to do one line from it, but... Let's see. Zognit kein mal as du gehst dem letzten Weg. Hat schimmeln blei in a verstellen blei a teg. Kommen wird nach unser Reus gebänkte Schau. Zweta Poten unser Trott mir seinen Do. Kommen wird nach unser Reus gebänkte Schau. Zweta Poten unser Trott mir seinen Do. So like you just did, her audience would presumably also have started singing along because they all knew it. Or the accordion or the piano on stage, he had it actually, you don't have a sheet music for it, but he, Rebling, Rebling accompanied her to that song. Um, but she sang that not just in Jewish context, which we have to assume this London concert had quite a few Jews in the audience, but she also went on tour with her husband to communist Asia. So she gave concerts um, in communist or non-aligned countries. So in August 1965, she gives a concert in Indonesia for rice farmers. And I circled, this is, it's Indo, I don't read Indonesian. If anybody in this room reads Indonesian, presumably you can confirm that I have correctly identified. It's Hirsch Glick's song and Hirsch Glick Basically, the only thing that he would have written that is in her repertoire is Zognit Kemal. Um, so this is her handwritten um, concert program for rice farmers in Indonesia. And she also sang that same song for factory workers in North Korea. Right before these, right before, so in, an, in Indonesia, the Communist Party of Indonesia hosted them. And this is right before this late September bloodletting when I think just recently we had some articles about this um, in the newspaper, when the military government basically murdered something like half a million communists and anyone who was presumed to be a communist. And many of these people were their friends. North Korea, this was one of the last um, examples of European culture coming to North Korea, which after this concert, not because of them, I don't think, um, basically started becoming suspicious of European culture. They're also, by the way, in China in 1965, right before 1966's um, Cultural Revolution, when Mao basically says, we're done with this whole bourgeois notion and we're done with Western learning. So they're one of the last to do that. So back in East Germany, she ends up meeting a Canadian. So I'm going to bring the Canadian in here for you. But he's, he's part of the story anytime, not just because I'm in Canada. It's true. It's true. <laughs> So a guy named Perry Friedman, who's a Canadian Jewish banjo player, ends up in East Germany for all sorts of reasons. And he lives there for 11 years. And he ends up bringing an American form of folk music called the Hoot Nanny to East Germany. So Hoot Nanny is basically where the line between the audience and the performer disappears and dissolves when everybody starts to sing together. So, Presumably, they would not have the fancy accordion. It would be maybe just a little piano. They might have had an accordion. But you can see, so this is an example of a hoot nanny. And she's probably singing all of these same songs in the hoot nanny. So I think the space that she is singing in really shapes how it's received. So on the one hand, she'll be in a marble hall performing for a thousand communists. And on the other hand, she'll be in an intimate space like this room for students. Here's another image of her performing in an intimate space. She and Perry Friedman in 1970 set up a big concert festival called the Festival of Political Song. 
um, which basically brings together musicians from across the world, not just the third world, um, but people who are opposed to American imperialism. Um, for example, in Southeast Asia, this is when the Vietnam War is going on, and there are lots of people not happy with that. Um, in 1973, this festival is dedicated to the Salvador Allende in Chile, who had just been overthrown by Pinochet, um, the military dictator who ends up ruling Chile for the next 20 years. Um, but I love this image because she's singing with Vietnamese women who have traveled to East Berlin, which is the hub of this sort of alternative universe of, of leftist music. They travel to Canada. This is not a photograph from Canada, but in 1979, because we're here in Canada, um, they come to Canada and they travel to uh, Montreal, Toronto, Winnipeg, and Vancouver um, in, on, in April, so it's connected to um, Yom HaShoah. And surprising that she managed to speak Yiddish in Montreal for the first time from the stage with the audience because there was such a large number of um, survivors who spoke Yiddish in Montreal. This is a photograph from her 1986 tour to the um, United States when the New York Times covered the story. She also, at last, made it to Israel in 1983. Um, and this is a photograph at Yad Vashem and Yad Vashem, as the story goes, and I have not yet found an archival record proving this, but basically I found archival references to everything else I've told you in the story, so I'm gonna assume that this is true. They were the first ones to actually sing German in Yad Vashem. Until this, this time, German was not to be spoken, sung in, um, in Yad Vashem because it was considered basically blasphemous to sing the language of the people who carried out the Holocaust in Yad Vashem, these guys broke that taboo. Back in Germany, the family is now performing. You saw the family in all of these other pictures. So the family is now touring along with um, Lynn and Eberhardt. And they perform in GDR as well. The whole family on stage, you got Lynn here, Eberhardt there. This is Katinka, the older daughter who was born during the war. And this is the woman I met over Shabbat dinner, Yalda Raebling. They put on shows, and Yalda does this, um, in 1987 she puts on this Days of Yiddish Culture in the Gorky Theater in East Berlin, which is wildly successful. Um, but Lynn's repertoire starts to change. She starts to recognize her own mortality, and she basically starts incorporating songs that are not political, that are more, let's call them, traditional Yiddish songs. This one goes back to 1899. So I think this is the oldest song in her repertoire. Um, it's called The Miller's Tears. And it's basically a reflection on her sense of mortality, is the way I guess I like to think of it. Wie verjohren, sannen verfohren, seit ich bin am Mirner Ottodo. Die Rede drehen sie, die Ohren gehen sie. Ich bin schon alt und greis und groß. Die Rede drehen sie, die Ohren gehen sie, ich bin schon alt und greis und groß. Hab gehört Sorgen, mir wird mich verjogen, a Häus von Dorf und von der Milch, die Rede drehen sie, die Ohren gehen sich, und ohne Ecken an der See, die Rede drehen sie, die Ohren gehen sich. Wo 
Willig weinen, wer wird mich scheinen? Ich bin schon alt, ich bin schon nicht. Die Rede drehen sich, die Jahren gehen sich, denn euch mit Segen heißt der Jehe, die Rede drehen sich. So Lynn, sorry, there was the song. <laughs> Lynn passes away in August 1988, just one year before the wall falls and East Germany ends up collapsing. Um, it's, the funeral is covered on television and Eric Honecker, the East German premier, sends condolence notes to the entire family. And this was me placing stones on her grave. And I think Julie was there yeah, with me. There. Um, and this grave is actually where the lights of German culture are buried, not in the Jewish cemetery, because she felt like she didn't um, really wasn't permitted to be buried in the Jewish cemetery because she married a non-Jew. And she was really committed to being a socialist first and a Jew second. We want to close this with the first video footage we have of her from the GDR. It's a 1962, I want to call it a biopic, but it's more like a concert pic, a concert film, called Lin Yaldati is Singing, Lin Yaldati Zint. Um, and it's, it's kind of crazy, and I don't need to explain it to you, but there's, when she sings Es brennt, for example, there's nuclear bombs going off in the background, um, which was actually not uncommon in the 1960s because there was a fear of a nuclear holocaust. And the word holocaust actually originally meant destruction by fire in the course of a nuclear war. But we're going to play you the clip from this... Um, from this concert film of the song that actually broke the taboo at Yad Vashem in German. It's called Friedenslied, or Peace Song, and it's by Hans Eisler. Friede in unserem Hause, Friede im Haus nebenan, Friede dem friedlichen Nachbarn, dass jedes gedeihen kann. Friede dem roten Platz und dem linken Monument und dem Brandenburger Tor und der Fahne, die drauf Friede den Jordan schufen, euch cool ist von Singapur. Friede den deutschen Bauern und den Bauern im großen Ballat. Friede auch den guten Gelehrten eurer Stadt Leningrad. Friede der Frau und dem Mann, Friede dem Reich und dem Kind. 